Hi, my name is Beth McIntyre and I work for Dow Agar Sciences. We're proud sponsors today of Dr. Joe Schwartz at the Ontario Grain Farmers March Classic event. Is that a fact? Is uh, my latest book, at least until the next one comes out, which is uh, Monkeys, Myths and Molecules, out, out May 1st. Uh, but um, I like the title of this one, Is That a Fact? Because life really should be based upon facts. Uh, not on hearsay, not on emotion, but uh, facts are, are not so easy to come by, and uh, they're sometimes difficult to to interpret. You know, it's it's uh, it's one thing to say that the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the square of the other two sides of a triangle. That's a fact, and that's not alterable. It's not discussable. That's what it is. But when it comes to the, the question of using uh, agrochemicals, uh, facts are, you know, are more ambivalent uh, because they're open to interpretation. And that's where we kind of run into trouble trying to explain science to, to the general public. Uh, because science is not white or black, it's various shades of gray. And uh, most of the time people want yes or no answers. And we can't deliver that. Uh, our answers come with many ifs and buts and maybes and uh, explanations. The word, the word chemical, unfortunately, has, has taken on a negative connotation. And it, it's quite interesting the way that that has happened because, you know, when I was growing back, up back in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, chemistry was, was highly regarded. Uh, I remember going in 1963 to the New York World's Fair uh, and uh, all the magnificent scientific displays. I remember going to the DuPont Pavilion where they had dancing molecules that told the story of chemistry and, and nobody thought anything negative about this. Uh, and then along came Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, uh, which I think was sort of the turning point, uh, claiming that uh, pesticides were harming the environment. And of course there was some truth to that because up to that time there wasn't as much regulation as there should have been and uh, many chemicals were overused. And then uh, chemistry kind of started its uh, downward slide uh, to, to a point where now the word chemical is synonymous with poison or, or toxin, which is very disturbing to us who you know work in this area because uh, everything in the world is made up of chemicals. It's not a dirty word. Uh, it's just a descriptor of the un units that everything is made up of. And they're not good. They're not bad. Uh, chemicals don't make any decisions. People make decisions. So what we need to do is really not to fear them, not to worship them, but to understand them. There are about 60 million known compounds in the world, and um, about 0.1 percent of those, that's all, are synthetics. And uh, most of those have been made since the Second World War, and have been released into the environment, of course, in, to various degrees. And there are about 80,000 chemicals that, that have appeared in various kind of products since the Second World War. And um, not all of those have been tested as you know uh, extensively as they in theory could be and this is a an area where people clamor you know for more testing because they say you know that we've unleashed all of these substances 0.1 percent of all the compounds you know that exist that we talk about which are synthetics in truth are probably better tested than the 99.9 percent .9 of the natural ones they're not all tested and then are all tested to the to the extent that maybe they should be but the natural compounds are not tested at all, you know. So, and so uh, the world is full of natural pesticides. Um, as I mentioned, coffee, which contains about a thousand compounds, many of them are naturally occurring pesticides, and they're carcinogens. And you know, they, I mean, they, they have the potential of causing the same kind of problems as, as any synthetic, because whether or not a substance is dangerous or not doesn't depend on its ancestry. It doesn't depend on whether it was made by nature or by a chemist. It depends on what it is, what its molecular structure is, how it interacts with other molecules in the body. And the only way you know that is by testing. The cornerstone of toxicology is, is a phrase that has been with us for 500 years, and that is that only the dose makes the poison. And numbers matter. It's, it, the uh, question that is very often asked is, is this dangerous or not? It's not answerable, because it depends on, on what the context is. Yes, pesticides can be dangerous. They have an innate hazard. Of course they do, otherwise they would not be good as pesticides. They're designed to kill pests. But we have to take into account what we're exposed to and how much we're exposed and in what way we're exposed. You can't test everything 
you know, on, on animals. It, it would take thousands and thousands and thousands of, of animals to do all the requisite testing. It's, it's logistically not possible. But there, there are some standard tests that, that we have learned over the years give us the, the proper information. It's not perfect, but it's, it's pretty good. And the reason that we know that it's pretty good is because life expectancy gets longer every year. And, uh, you know, one of our biggest problems now is what to do with all the senior citizens. Our, our fastest growing segment of the population are centenarians, you know. So we're not killing off people in, in droves. There are, there are myths out there about, you know, cancer, that we, we have a cancer epidemic. This is demonstrably not true. Uh, there's very good cancer data compiled both by uh, Canadian um, Cancer Associations and, and the American Cancer Society. And uh, basically, cancer rates are, are, are flat. We, we have to improve uh, our food supply because there are going to be more and more people coming to dinner. And um, they will have to be fed and they expect to be fed properly. You know, we've been eating uh, a lot of meat here in North America. How can we tell the Chinese now who are, you know, developing uh, their agriculture and, and their technology, no, you can't have that. It isn't going to be done organically. Uh, organic agriculture, which uses uh, no synthetic pesticides, no synthetic fertilizers, and no genetic modification, is going to be a niche market. Uh, it will be an increasing market, but, but it's never going to feed the 10 billion people who are coming to dinner by 2050. So we have to innovate. And one of those innovations is genetic modification. Uh, and uh, this is a, a difficult pill for many people to swallow because they don't really understand it. They know that genes are important. You ask them what they are and they know something about heredity, uh, but that's about all, all they know. And they know that they don't want the genes mucked about with in any, any way. Well, genetics is a very complicated business and genetic modification of foods is, is scary to, to a lot of people, especially when you have activists saying that, that they're putting Agent Orange on our food. Uh, this is just not true. Uh, what is being referred to here is a, a technology whereby uh, crops are going to be genetically modified so that they can withstand being sprayed with 2,4-D, which is a widely used herbicide. It will kill the weeds but not kill the crop. And this obviously is of great benefit to the farmer. Uh, the activists bring out arguments against this, uh, saying that the crops are going to be sp sprayed with Agent Orange. Well, this is uh, ridiculous alarmism. Uh, Agent Orange, which was used in Vietnam as a defoliant, was a mixture of two specific chemicals, 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T. Both of these cause leaves to fall off trees. Well, it turned out that they did more than just cause leaves to fall off trees. They had a teratogenic effect, which meant they affected uh, during babies during pregnancy. Uh, they had a carcinogenic effect. Uh, and uh, this is now not debatable, but we know what the effect was. The effect was due to a side product that was formed during the manufacture of 2,4,5-T. And that side product is tetrachlorodibenzodioxin, which usually is just abbreviated as, as dioxin. Very, very nasty material. Because of that, 2,4,5-T's production was stopped more than 40 years ago. It, it no longer exists. 2,4-D, which was the other component of Agent Orange, does not give rise to tetrachlorodibenzodioxin, and it cannot. If you know the structure of the molecule and you know what can happen and how the, the dioxins form, you know that you cannot form the uh, TCDD with 2,4-D. With Yet the activists link this together because they say that, you know, this was part of Agent Orange, which is true, and now this, they say to bring Agent orange on your crops, which really isn't true because the part that was the problem is not the 2,4-D. Uh, so it's a difficult uh, challenge to get people to understand this because you have to understand some of the underlying chemistry. You have to understand why it's not possible to get that dioxin side product from 2,4-D, whereas you can get it from 2,4-5-T. Well, I, I think, you know, an important concept is that we take risks with everything every day of our life. You get in your car, you take a risk. Now, you don't think about it, uh, but basically it comes down to an evaluation of, of risk versus benefit. Because the chance of having an accident in that car is, is very small, but it's real, right? It's, it's measurable. People don't 
think twice about that. They don't think twice about flying in airplanes. They don't think twice about numerous other things that are risky in life. But when it comes to things like pesticides, then all of a sudden, you know, it becomes a major issue. Well, you have to do the same kind of risk-benefit analysis. And yes, there's a risk. But the reason to take that risk is because the benefits are so overwhelming. This video is brought to you by Farms.com.